So the first great myth is that not everybody is a singer. Everybody is a singer. So singing mm. really meant nothing to me, and that was great in terms of vocal freedom because you know when nothing's hanging on it, you're not attaching your identity to it. You're not feeling safe or unsafe around doing it. Mm-hmm. The voice just grows on its own. I don't think I've really found my style. Mm-hmm. However, I've become comfortable with how my body innately sounds. What anyone teaches, they teach in pure innocence, and they okay. teach what they know. And listen to a speech language pathologist, listen to doctors, listen to surgeons, because that's going to give you a more holistic picture of how the body works. Being able to deliver in your craft ends up being financial security for you. You got to find what you are really strong at. Hmm. and you got to go hard on that because if you're naturally gifted at something it's going to accelerate faster hmm. if you have this sort of parasitic utilitarian scheming kind of stance it breaks the fabric of the music community Today is a treat for all of us. We have a powerhouse of a vocalist, a jazz soul singer who owns it across R&B, blues, pop, funk, fusion, you name it. She has worked with Louis Banks, Ranjit Parrot, Dhruv Kanekar, Gino Banks and so many more people. She has played big stages internationally she has lent her voice to many brands a netflix series now you may have heard her single run which was the top of the top 10 singles in 2021 by rolling stone india or you may recognize her voice from the powerful title track of kangna ranaut star dhakad one of the finest vocalists in this country right now and certainly one of my favorites Vasundha we welcome to the show how are you today i'm very good uh, i'm feeling energized uh, at first i felt like very soothed walking into the space because of how beautifully you set it up thank you and now i'm just feeling excited to get to do this and to talk to you about uh, yeah about a bunch of things today okay so um you have such a massive control mm. um on what you can do with your voice <laughs> uh the first time i heard you live i was truly blown and um there were, i remember there was this really emotive performance where i think you actually cried a little but <laughs> it did not it did not actually derail any even the slightest nuance in your performance so uh, that was truly moving for me and i guess uh, how how was it that you found um the zone of where your voice falls in hmm hmm uh lots to unpack there actually uh well i started out singing and i didn't care at all about singing i was 3 years old mm-hmm. and i was in a family that wanted that believed that you know some sort of cultural training and uh, ingrainment is important for children So singing really meant nothing to me and that was great in terms of vocal freedom because you know when nothing's hanging on it hmm. uh in terms of uh you know uh, you're not attaching your identity to it you're not feeling safe or unsafe around doing it hmm. the voice just grows on its own hmm. uh in my teens is when you know everybody's looking for their identity and singing at that point became my thing and i also became my school's competition pony mm. so i used to be sent, sent for all the competitions and stuff winning became important mm. and at that time i began to control my voice mm. and uh, that was the beginning uh, and in my early 20s uh, it led to so much controlling because i thought the control was giving me the good output mm-hmm. Mm, that i completely lost my voice uh, in my early 20s mm. and uh, i had a blues gig and the gig was going way too well it was supposed mm. to be 90 minutes went on for 3 hours audience wouldn't let us oh. leave and i thought blues matlab jaan laga ke ga do mm. so uh, i gave it my all and then my voice went just out like a light mm. and after that for an entire month i could not make a single sound i would go ah and there would be like this feeling of burning and pain throughout my system. Mm. Was there bleeding? 
Mm-hmm. There wasn't bleeding. I had nodules. I had severe mm. inflammation at that point, and I had mm. I had nodules as well. Mm. Two years after that, I had to keep popping steroids in order to sing because I didn't mm. know how to bring the inflammation down. And uh, finally, I found my guru, mm. uh, uh, my teacher Mark Baxter, and uh, he took me on, and he rewired my voice in three weeks. Oh, within a month. Uh, I had double the range I had ever had, hmm. and that's when I learned that voice is not about control. It's just about permission. Hmm. You allow yourself to express to such an extent that even you are not in your own way, hmm. and that is when the voice is truly free to do. what it needs to it has access to its entire range its entire dynamic range its entire articulatory range and you don't see yourself even considering a step in between what you're imagining and what's coming out so if you want to cry you cry if you want to you know giggle you giggle and the voice is still going to kind of wiggle around it and and find its way wow so um it was a long long story of of not caring caring too much controlling too much and then learning how to systematically lose control hmm. with the voice and uh, i don't know which performance you were talking about but it's very often that i cry if, <laughs> like you know so, that's why sometimes it's i like blue frog yeah <laughs> okay at blue I, frog huh hmm. but yeah i i i cry way too often and uh, <laughs> maybe i need to get <laughs> hold of that as well <laughs> no, no i wouldn't change a thing how old were you when you found your style and how would you describe your style i don't think i've really found my style mm-hmm. however i think i've become comfortable with how my body innately sounds hmm. because uh, as a vocalist you're blessed with you know if you're if you're blessed with time or if you're in love with time with rhythm mm-hmm. then you can manage to fit into many styles mm-hmm. and uh, uh, so uh, more than the style aspect in terms of genre mm-hmm. it's a delivery style i think which which becomes more innate to you and mm-hmm. uh, so when i started doing that long study of what does my voice sound like without any filters mm. in the beginning actually i used to you know keep bothering my teacher saying that you know i don't like how i'm sounding because yeah. when i started out when i was in that competition pony phase i was a full copy artist and mm. that time mariah carey whitney houston christina aguilera these yeah. were the reigning oh, queens yeah Everybody yeah. wanted to sound like them. Absolutely. So, class nine, I'm sounding exactly like Mariah Carey. Mm-hmm. Next day, I have Whitney Houston, exactly like her, <laughs> right? So, for me, that was the right way to sing. Yeah. And yeah. you know, if you sing a song, you're singing like the singer. Absolutely. Yeah. And along the way, I also started doing character voices. That was my first paying job, actually. <laughs> And uh, so, I, every other voice but my own was what I was awesome at. Yeah. <laughs> and then in my 20s i started realizing oh there's something my body innately does which nobody mm. has and how come i felt that that wasn't even worth a thought mm. so yeah making making friends with with my innate sound and then you know everything else is a branch of it after that yeah i i had an amy lee phase too <laughs> And uh, definitely, a genie in the bottle would always be sung exactly the way <laughs> Christina Aguilera does. Yeah, with the choreography <laughs> and all. It took quite a bit of work to come out of that aping phase mm. and just let your voice be. And acha. So you are an educator as well. Yeah. What's a weakness or mm. um, say something that your students can could have avoided early on had mm. they. uh started training earlier hmm hmm or they just had you know good guidance hmm uh see uh first let me define the type of educator i am because i'm not a schooled singer yeah so i don't teach music hmm. but you know like a guitar player might go to guitar school and mm-hmm. then another might go to luthiering school mm-hmm. so i'm that side of things for voice mm-hmm. i'm the the physical a physical physical mental mind body relationship mm. and uh, how to how to find and ride your instrument with mm. trust and uh, so i feel that i have no complaints even though early on i used to have frustrations because the contemporary um 
understanding of voice mm-hmm. relies on the more recent developments in science where you know the voice became more visible otherwise mm. it's invisible and it's mostly unfelt so there are a lot of ideas notions around the voice that developed over the years in mm. pedagogical situations which were not exactly sound mm. and you know so back in the day early on in the early days when i was learning the the new information i was like why was i never taught this but that mm. was a judgmental sort of attitude for me to have mm. because as i went along i noticed that what anyone teaches they teach in pure innocence mm. they teach with the the intent to grow someone else and they okay. teach what they know yeah and even for me uh, under mark's guidance i uh, and then you know i started looking at more medical stuff rather mm. than more singing related stuff so mm. that you know and he would also always say that just just go uh, uh, and listen to a speech language pathologists listen to doctors listen to surgeons because that's going to give you a more holistic picture of how the body works mm. and uh, uh, so you know now i realize the the innocence of the flaws that existed before mm-hmm. and uh, i'm able to have like a a, a warmer kind of in you know, not a mm-hmm. war like <laughs> yeah. attitude towards it and um, I, and you know when one singer finds freedom Mm. they tell all their friends and so the thing is that it it's moving out exponentially now it's a normal thing to discuss vocal health and you know yeah. how to uh, how to emote with, innately with your voice so i'm i'm super happy is that is that why you started school of voice mm. yeah well i just wanted to organize it and give it a name mm-hmm. uh i have many many dreams in terms of what i want it to be because I know that the voice is not just a tool for performance mm-hmm. but the voice has an impact on your body the human is a co-regulating animal mm. so my voice right now my voice in singing in speech has a regulating impact on you absolutely and you know there are a lot of these things that I want to explore with singers mm-hmm. I want to do singing for non singers because mm. it it is such a health imperative to be able to sing freely without yeah. the pressure of it being looked at as a skill yeah so uh, right now i'm mostly doing rehab type stuff for mm-hmm. singers who've lost their voices and and all of that but uh, but later uh, and also when i find more time in my life which i don't know when i will mm. i'm going to expand it to become much more Mm. So you said that you are not a schooled uh, singer. So what has been your background and experience in music? The stage has been my classroom always. Mm. Uh when I was really small my grandmother so it's small meaning 2 and 1/2 years old. Mm. Uh my grandma was taking her nap and uh, I I was an only child so I was a pro at entertaining myself. Mm. And so I was just sitting by the window and there was this tree in front of the room and you know I was singing. And uh, she heard someone singing and according to her it was fabulous and she mm. wanted to see who was singing and it was me. Mm. and so she keeps uh, repeating this phrase that i told everybody it would be a criminal offense not to teach mm. her to sing <laughs> but she was an educator herself mm-hmm. and she found a teacher who would just make me sing she said i don't want you to give her any rules i want her to just fall in love with singing mm. wow and so uh, she used to teach in modern school and so the music teacher of modern school would come home and he would just make me sing oh. uh so in my first classroom i had no rules and i i mean the person i am now is kind of like that as well mm-hmm. um uh, but the process of you know looking at music as play mm-hmm. that was the first input that i got after that it was always school choir then mm-hmm. you know joining choirs other than the school choir mm-hmm. uh participating in bands doing recordings like i i learned everything in just the prep of material and by the grace of god i was picked by people who were way better than me so mm-hmm. i always had mentorship without even knowing that i had it mm-hmm. my colleagues were much older than me they knew what to make me listen to and you know the music community of delhi is 
so embracing so i mean i am i am a child of the community and mm. i i'm so proud to say that you know uh, there was a recording i went for and it was uh, for nitin malik i had just started singing mm-hmm. i didn't know what to charge mm. right so i just said whatever and i just wanted to do the work mm. and uh, i stepped out and he cut me a check of double the amount and he said i am not taking you Mm. undervaluing yourself again right nobody would do that nobody mm. who was there you know just like uh, to hire me and you know uh, get me to work i was a kid at another time there was another uh, producer who mm. had called me for a jingle and uh, after i went home he sent me tutorials uh, youtube was new that time uh uh-huh. he sent me tutorials and he said listen to this and see what melodic choices you can make other than the ones you're naturally choosing mm. you know so at the universe the community everybody just seemed to be bent on giving me information to chew on mm. so wow i'm getting emotional mm, yeah. <laughs> that's my background and i think that's why community is such a big piece for me as well yeah yeah wow <laughs> give me a minute <laughs> no i'm good <laughs> Hmm. Yeah. That's called wearing your heart on a sleeve. Hmm. I cried the drop of a hat. Oh. How did you get to a point of becoming financially stable? Oh wow, that's a great one. That's a great one. Well, uh I come from a privileged background and for a long time I had the support of my family. Hmm. But because of uh uh good parenting rules my parents also said at one point come on uh, you know we want to see that you can do it yourself mm. uh so my financial uh intelligence was very low right mm. i'm a giver i mean i would never buy stuff for myself i'd be buying like you know i would be buying dream gifts for my friends and you know my financial mm. understanding was zero saving zero mm. nothing mm. somehow whenever i needed money work would present itself mm. right like i was off pocket money i was off, you know anything that i had to buy i was able to buy for myself and that's all i understood so that was very very wrong i spent the majority of my 20s mm. floating through life riding on all the work that's coming not mm. having any uh, uh financial sense mm. but after that uh, recently we met a financial planner he told us how we as musicians have to think about retirement mm-hmm. and uh, we've started building our retirement corpus now and and stuff uh what i believe in retrospect really is that being able to deliver mm. in your craft ends up being financial security for you mm. because the possibility of repeated income the possibility of growth the possibility of upgrading your income levels right comes as you actually upgrade in your skill mm. and i have not done any branding work because i was never hip to it Hmm. but the point was that every time or most times that i went into a room i was able to deliver what was asked so you know if income is the first pillar of being able to start your journey of financial stability being able to deliver is the backbone is the spine yeah. uh, for that yeah. so i keep telling everybody that yes it is true that you can become wildly successful without being excellent hmm. but your excellence is going to protect you there are going to be times when you're successful and then there's going to be a lull bit after that fame or that you know reputation gained hmm. and that's when your excellence is going to pay your bills so i feel i feel being able to deliver and then starting to plan what you're doing with that money mm-hmm. small money over a long time becomes a ton of money so mm-hmm. even if you're yeah. saving 1000 buck in your early 20s every month it makes a difference if you make that 5000 right it's a huge amount of money that you're going to end up with when you're in your 40s you know uh, a lot of musicians they are still kind of developing their artistry mm. through their 20s and 30s mm. and somewhere that tug of war starts happening where you're doing some things for the money yeah. and then you're kind of developing your skills 
towards that. Yeah. But your artistry is pulling you in another direction. And mm. so you have to devote time towards that. Mm. So have you faced that? And um, w- what would you say as to handling that kind of pull and push, that mm. kind of dichotomy that happens? I think people start out being professional at different levels. Yeah. And you got to find what you're really strong at. Hmm. And you got to go hard on that because if you're naturally gifted at something, it's going to accelerate faster. Hmm. I think it is first important to look at the skills you can monetize and then think of artistry. Like right now, I'm thinking more along the artistry lines. Before this, for the last 15 years, I've only been thinking skill. In how many ways can I be useful to the music? So, you know, people would say you sing too many genres and, you know, versatility is not a great thing when you want to be an artist. Ah. It's true. because, Mm. And that's the first thing my teacher also told me. He said versatility is uh, is an artist killer. Mm. And I was like, what? Mm. And, you know, here everybody's profile singer is a versatile singer. singer. (laughs) In in India, it's a different game. Generalists are definitely rewarded more than specialists, at least in the arts. Yeah, but when you're an artist, what Uh. what Mark meant when he said that was that, you know, you you have to be a mimicable. Mm. That, you know, the salient features of your craft are just so out there that people can mimic you. Second is that your name should be consonant with a sound. Mm. And that means going along quite a narrow path for a long period of time. Yeah, Mariah Carey, it's a sound. Michael Jackson's a sound. Stevie Wonder's a sound. Bjork. Yeah, <laughs> Bjork is a sound. sound. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So your name has to signify a sound. That means the Mm. repeating of that sound is so important, which Mm. means, again, you're narrowing your lane for a while. So that's why he said that when when it comes to artistry, you got to pick that narrow lane, Mm. that lane that never tires you, that lane that never feels dry. Mm. And but for me, up until now, now is when I'm thinking of artistry. I was always only thinking of skill. And Mm. I it and that's another trip. (laughs) Yes. You know, yeah. and uh, it's so, 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 so rewarding and uh, so educative. And you really learn how to respect music first. Yeah. You know, sometimes you're like, I'm an artist and, you know, like this music is mine. And, and yes, of course, all that is there. But y- to understand the vastness of the thing that music is, the livingness, the changingness of it, how it becomes a different entity when channeled through like different people in your environment. And then who are you in that context? Mm. So being able to change, being able to adjust and being able to really not really be important in that moment. Yeah. And to just just pull out this, the, the relevant skill and just enough of that relevant skill. Yeah. That's like, that's so much. Mm. My my teacher used to say this. She still says it. Um, I remember you're just a vehicle. Mm. How necessary is it to find um, a mentor or a coach to hone your art? And of course, your skills. I think mentorship is everything. Because a mentor not only... Um, guides you in terms of what you want to learn next or what you want to hear next. Mm. But you learn attitude. Mm. You learn ethic. You learn personality. I think it goes two ways. We need to find a mentor whom we really idolize as a person as well. Mm -hmm. That's what I believe. Mm -hmm. And, uh, And the other thing is, I think, finding a mentor who... See, we all have biases inside us. Yeah. And in any educational system, there is a bias as well. Either the yeah. bias is towards jazz or towards uh, Western classical or towards mm. whatever. Find a mentor who shares your biases. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that's a good one. Yeah. So I think mm. I think those are the things that will accelerate us. Mm. And as you change, you might change your mentor as well. Mm. But I think sometimes the core values, the deepest values mm. kind of stay the same. So you hop from... Uh, a similar type of mentor Mm. uh, a hop between similar types of mentors but each serving a different purpose in your life yeah what are some of the misconceptions that you've come across Mm. um, that uh, aspiring singers or musicians have about the music business and what should they be aware of according to you I'm not the hippest business person so Mm. I'm not a good one to give business advice Mm. but 
I can give people advice because I've spent time in the community, like infinite hours in the community. First of all, you know, people are like, I'll just show up at this person's gig and keep saying hi. You know, I'll keep DMing, I'll keep doing this, right? And mm. there's a sense because there's a fantasy around hustle culture. Mm. So I feel that, you know, that utilitarian stance towards people who are doing good work or better work or the type of work you do. Mm. If you have this sort of parasitic utilitarian scheming kind of stance, mm. it breaks the fabric of the music community. Mm. And rather than that, I think focusing on being fabulous at one thing or two things or three things, whatever calls out to you, putting mm. those on display, showing your utility, signaling your utility. Mm. I think that works really well. Because again, the first thing is you got to bring in money before you plan your money. Yeah. And you got to deliver. So you got to show what you can deliver. Mm. And as soon as you've done that twice, thrice, you start gaining a reputation for it. Mm. So um, I I just feel that, you know, being very human about how you go about your life in the arts also has a financial kind yeah. of blessing that comes with it. Absolutely. I think the other myth, and uh, this is a socially uh, learned one, uh, which we would all do really well in terms of our mental health to break, mm. is I got to be famous and rich and young. <laughs> yes. Right? Yeah. Everybody knows that they're not all starting out at the same level mm -hmm. or with the same resources or with the same network or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Right? So, you know, by the time singers are turning 25, 26, they're like, shit, I've missed the bus. 30, oh shit, buddhi ho gai. <laughs> right? Yeah. But a simple Google search will show you how many people have had huge careers which they just started at the age of 35 or 31 or 32 or 36 or 40. And if there are people winning Grammys at the age of 75, why uh -huh. do you have to, have to, have to be young and hot and rich and popular <laughs> and everything? <laughs> yeah. Why? Why? So what is that void inside mm -hmm. that needs it so urgently? That yeah. needs it so urgently that you don't even care what you put out in that moment. Hmm. Because then people start suffering the consequences yeah. of the life that comes out of that. So humanizing your existence within the community and also uh, letting go of these uh, unnecessary fantasies. Yeah. That would be great. I think we're in for the long haul mm -hmm. and we are here. We're here to make something great that's ideally going to outlive us. Yeah. And that's it. The day you crack it, you've cracked it. After that, after that, kya? After that, you're yeah. riding on that and building on it. Hmm. Right. Do you think maybe somewhere this is also um, coming from like an external influence of the pop culture, the ageist factor in... Not uh, just, not just, I mean, I, even parents. Oh. I've, I've had phone calls from parents who are saying, you know, uh, my kid is 16. You mm. got to train her fully by the time she's 18 because she's got to make it big by 21 because after that, it's over. It's It, it runs way too deep. It runs mm. way too deep. Uh, and uh, the closer it is to you, the more you start thinking that it's but natural to think like that. Yeah. 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 Have you, have you uh, uh, observed that a lot of the uh, teaching or... Um, Training around vocals mm -hmm. does involve a lot of counseling as well. <laughs> and not just with the student, but their parents also. Yeah. yeah. Well, mm -hmm. mostly mostly the people I coach are all grown up. They're like mm -hmm. 25 plus because 25, 23, 25 is the first time people's voices start acting up. Yeah. <laughs> so mm -hmm. thankfully, I don't have to deal with parents. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think... All teaching has a very kind of therapeutic part to it because you're mm -hmm. opening up a person and their self-concept is changing. Mm -hmm. And that shows a lot in the voice. So it's much more present in the voice. Yeah, The body remembers everything that has happened to you. Mm -hmm. So everything that has happened to you is visible in your voice. Yeah. And sometimes as a, a, as a coach, I have this x-ray vision 
Mm. And I'm like, oh, th- I see this, but there's not the right time to talk about it. Mm. <laughs> you know, and our boundaries are such yeah. that, you know, it only has to come and then it might be addressed in some way. So, yes, that is a big piece of it. You know, interestingly, the voice uh, captures so much of your self-concept mm-hmm. that, you know, there are these workshops that I've done in the past where we've made a very young person sound mm-hmm. like, let's say, 15 years older. Mm-hmm. We've uh, made a female identifying person mm-hmm. sound androgynous and then straight up male mm-hmm. without because the self-concept rides in the voice. Mm. And, you know, uh, so, so much so much else, time of day, mm. uh, state of health, state of mind, but most of all self-concept. Yeah. So who you think you are is what you sound like. And, you know, so then when you're training someone to expand that, you got to somehow also signal to them that they need to see themselves as something larger. Mm. The voice starts giving them proof and they're like, oh. Yeah. So, yeah. So then that positive setting up that positive loop also is is quite a thing in class. Mm. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what are some of the strange myths you've come across about vocals mm. uh, or, or musical pursuits, creative or technical, mm. say, um, age or mm. gender in all these years? Well, vocally, there are way too many myths. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think the first first myth is that singing is a special skill. Mm. Yeah. So you might have different levels of skill but mm. anybody who can speak can sing. can sing just like anybody who can walk and move their hands can dance mm-hmm. and the important thing is that appreciating the innateness of singing mm. and its deep connection to our health our mental well-being our you know self-regulation capabilities mm. our ability to give ourselves permission to express like that mm. like my grandmom she mm. sings completely out of tune, completely out of time, but she's going to belt it. Mm. Wow. And she's that kind of person. And and once you see her life story, you realize that, of course, this is the type of person who would live this kind of a life. Mm. So the first great myth is that not everybody is a singer. Everybody is a singer. Mm. Second great myth is singing is an art form. Yes, the acquiring of the skill of singing might be an art form, but singing is medicine. Singing is a health thing. Singing is important for public health. And and like I, I cannot overstate the importance of mm. uh, of singing in, uh, in well-being. Then when we step into the arena of singers, that there are high notes. That's a myth, <laughs> right? High frequency, high pitch. Yeah. is a different concept but a high note like high and low notes are ear training concepts yeah we take them as the truth hmm. but notes are not spatially anywhere yeah and it's just a very small change in the length of your vocal folds that causes a significant change in pitch mm-hmm. so there are no high notes And uh, that's a shock. And that also sounds kind of stupid rolling out of, you know, (laughs) anybody's (laughs) mouth. But it's the truth. Hmm. So things such as that. Another big myth is when you're growing your voice, you think, you know, to get a semitone increase in your range, you're going to need six months of practice. Two minutes. So when you are targeting the right behaviors Mm -hmm. to rebalance, to calibrate, to harmonize Mm -hmm. Uh, growth is instant and growth is exponential and after that growth is uncontrolled Mm. because then the body takes over and the way it's going to grow on its own without even your permission is Mm. mind-blowing tell me if you've come across this that i'm 25 and uh, i didn't take the opportunity earlier to develop my range and i tell Mm. them all that I have done most of my range development after the age of 25. Mm -hmm. So people somehow have this myth that 
um it's only when you're young that the maximum stretching or whatever they, they think of the range as like height mm-hmm. that you're going to keep growing only until a point and then that's it mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah i think i think a good reframing of that uh, pursuit is range discovery Mhm and and you know in your 20s you're still very young it's not like you're you know really aged or anything mm. so you're still in the peak of your uh, health and um people who continue to leave the voice to its own devices while working on you know calibration mm. of uh, various elements in the voice they have full full voices look at Aretha Franklin singing at this age mm uh so uh there is no expiry date for the voice and um the voice is going to change as your body changes every few years yeah but allowing it the wiggle room to still give you the same output is going to keep your voice working perfectly for very long and maybe even better mm. i think i have a better voice now than i had in my early 20s mm. because throughout our lives you know the larynx is is on this journey of descent so mm. you get this naturally darker tone and then you can harness other tonalities in your voice mm. to make an even fuller picture so uh um the more you age you have actually gifts to uncover the mm. third thing is we need to look at ourselves as a species of animal we forget that we are animals mm. So just like a chihuahua is going to work in a particular way mm. in a range yeah and maybe a saint bernard word or mm. you know um there are different types of voices mm-hmm. but they have access to that entire range mm. that a human of that type is given so your range expansion is more of a discovery of range rather mm. than you know stretching it Uh-huh. and because then what's the end to stretching it right yeah so you can claim everything that nature has endowed you hmm that's what range right. is what do you think of the ai voice replacement tech that's being rolled out now i love it i find it very interesting and uh, you know uh, the mimicry of voices as you know i mean been a thing for me when i was a mm. child yeah. so i find it really amazing that a machine can do it uh, i really feel that there's so much for us as like voice obsessed people mm-hmm. to explore to see how that happened and yeah. you know what is it that they cracked that they mm-hmm. make such life like simulations of people's voices mm-hmm. i'm not scared of ai i'm mm-hmm. not scared of change really we'll mm-hmm. see what happens we are all creative people yeah. being creative people we are perfectly poised to live in a changing world so like mm-hmm. what's the big deal <laughs> okay um a successful performance mm. um defined as um the audience experiencing the impact that you intended to deliver mm-hmm. how do you as a performer attempt that there are many levels to this mm-hmm. so the design of the list for example the set list even if it's not your own music yeah. but you'll treat every song that you're singing that day as though it was your own yeah and you'll weave a story using the set list mm-hmm. so that gives because the same set list in another jumble would make a different story yeah so uh utilizing uh the power of order of songs is is one way you can make an impact on mm-hmm. uh people of a room the second thing is what impact you will make you don't know yeah but you can set an intention out how you want to exist in that space mm-hmm. and people might receive it in different ways and like very surprising ways mm. uh and i think that is the most successful sort of um performance uh because you came as you you gave everything you had you managed to find a flow between five people on stage mm. you all created an energy which was which then transmuted different people in different ways mm. some were happy some made a call to their mothers that's a story actually that i need <laughs> to share with you and uh, you you see how a live music is and and the different ways that the same signal mm. can translate on another's body and on another's mind mm. so that mother story was yeah. uh, <laughs> was uh, back in the day i was singing in piano man and it was just a, a duo a uh, song in the set list we had a full band with just mm. a guitar player and me and uh, i saw this man 
at the back looking like that and then i burst into tears and he burst into tears at the same time mm. and i saw that and i was like okay this is getting too intense i looked away and then after the show uh, about half an hour after the show he comes back and uh, he says you know uh, i hadn't made a call to my mom uh, mm. in many years and you sang that song and something connected and i've spoken to her for the first time today in years oh, wow so i think i think that's massive i think that's something i could have never calculated or imagined mm. but uh, but yeah man music uh, uh, his his life his relationship with his mother was mm. healed because of how he took in just an open intent mm. and yeah i i think that's that's where the magic is Okay mm. India we have a um, very diverse population mm. um not just um, uh, culturally mm. but also when it comes to wealth mm. and um this is a huge population the largest in the world right now mm. which is talented and aspirational yeah. in ways more than one but the wealth inequality is deep it impacts everything in in ways that uh, i don't think anyone can fully even grasp mm. so what is a healthy way to think about privilege mm. well here's a piece of news mm. um with global music institute uh-huh uh I've been working um on this Ambedkar SOSE uh Schools of Specialized Excellence project that the Delhi government has started. Mhm. Mm uh music is now a main subject just like there used to be it's a stream just like science and humanities and commerce. Uh-huh. Four entire years of music as your central subject Ooh. is being offered as at the government school level in Delhi. how oh. and uh, gmi is the knowledge partner and mm -hmm. i wrote the western music curriculum for all the four years we are mm -hmm. in, uh, doing teacher training and stuff now but uh that access things and so recently i went to one of the government schools mm -hmm. to see you know how the curriculum is translating if the kids are learning and you know what uh, issues the teachers might be having with the curriculum i wrote and i saw the dreams i saw but but what i love is now these are kids who do not have the kind of privilege that i did mm -hmm. but they have access and they mm. have me and mm. they have gmi mm. they have people who are who are now there saying you want to do this we are here and mm -hmm. i'm so proud that at a government level this was mm. decided and uh and you know there were 6000 applicants in, uh, for the previous batch oh and if huh. people say western music mm -hmm. is niche i don't see that anymore no not at all yeah so uh i mean this has been a dream last 2 years working on this mm -hmm. and i know that you know this is one of the ways that we could have used our privilege yeah and there are possibly many others right now i don't have creative ideas for it but i'm sure that we can bridge that gap and include people and you know participation is such an important thing mm. opening space for open participation yeah. is what you know because we work we we move around in little clusters and little uh what's it called clicks yeah yeah and 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 for a while we should open up that damn click and get people in mm. and and you know like i understand in a city like bombay clicks work because a lot of financial stuff is also riding on that right yeah. you don't want to take away work from your dear friend mm -hmm. but but having said that maybe at an experimental level and maybe later at a more at a larger system level we can open it up uh we should see privilege as a resource mm. we should not see privilege as a as a status symbol if mm. you've been given it you know uh, and if your heart aligns with the idea then open it up mm. and and allow people share teach just hang out just mm. share a story you don't even know what's going to land how in somebody else's life mm. so um we need to practice 
generosity with privilege rather than practicing discrimination yeah with privilege um is there anything else you'd like to touch upon you know there's one interesting thing that i've been mulling over recently i sang a marathi song right basically me the reason why i picked up this topic at all was that i don't speak marathi mm. na my kind of voice is is never cast in this kind of music yeah, yeah. and uh, i but i can see re- why they cast cast it you know the composition demanded it yeah and he he somehow heard it and i remember him telling me before the the release this is not an experiment this is a stunt mm. <laughs> and uh, but for me um when we were discussing the song he asked me if i relate and i relate so deeply mm. and i realized that i had got the opportunity to sing a story that is true to me that i would never have had the courage to mm. release separately or to even say separately mm. and somehow the song became an outlet for me to uh, to acknowledge and pour out like part of my life mm. and it was so interesting that it happened in a language that i do not speak and of course you know ajay ji coached me so much on the phone and mm. all to get the diction as close to correct as possible mm. but i wanted to share about how magical this whole music thing is mm-hmm. and how there are strange synchronicities that happen and ajay ji was looking for a sort of westernish and also a deeper sort of a voice for the song i suppose mm-hmm. and he happened to hear the intro of uh, run which is mm-hmm. my single with dhruv and he heard the intro and the intro was lit- written last moment mm-hmm. uh he heard that intro and he's like i want something like this for the song and you know because because the brief uh, to me was based off of something that i had already done you know uh-huh. i felt it was it would be very exciting to to see how i can translate that into um into this kind of a project and uh, and it turned out to be like such such a big gift wow So yeah again you know like circling back to that idea of you don't even know how many ways your particular skill set or your current skill set mm-hmm. whether you're fully developed as an artist or not mm-hmm. is utilizable and uh, and how it's going to land with different people it's just i mean it's 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 pure magic at the end of the day how things work mm-hmm. and yeah. I'm kind of like that I always am leaning on the side of magic <laughs> than on the side of strategy <laughs> yeah mm. truly truly profound in so many ways so many insights in here my god vasundra thank you thank you so much for being here today for um, coming in uh, just pouring your heart out uh, <laughs> with with everything um incredible truly thank you so much thank you for having me i'm glad we could make it happen <laughs>